Welcome to Module 5, Lecture 3. This is Part 2. We're going to be deriving the canonical commutation relation, the commutator between position and momentum. Okay, let's recap what we learned in the first part of this lecture. We have three position operators, Rx hat, Ry hat, Rz hat, and three momentum operators, Px hat, Py hat, Pz hat. The Hamiltonian is the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy, kinetic energy being 1 over 2m, p hat x squared plus p hat y squared plus p hat z squared, and then the potential being v of rx, ry, rz. It doesn't matter what order or how we put them in in the potential because all of the position operators commute with themselves and all the momentum operators commute with themselves. So this is just a review of what we have seen before with regards to both position and momentum. There's one other point, however. Position and momentum operators in different directions also commute. So Px will commute with Ry, and Pz will commute with Rx, and so forth. The ones that don't commute are the position and momentum in the same direction. These commutation relations, they can't be derived from anything. It's really a postulate of quantum mechanics. And so we'll be taking it as a postulate. But you're going to find in this lecture that we actually can motivate very strongly exactly what the position and momentum operator commutators are in the same direction. And it's related to what we did with the commutation relations for spin, where we were able to get all of those commutation relations just by looking at the properties of the operators themselves. So our job is to find out what is this commutator between position and momentum when they're both in the same direction, just like we did with spin. I want to be very careful to point out that this is a motivation. It is not a rigorous derivation. There'll be a couple of places where there's almost a sleight of hand. I will point that out to you when it occurs so that you're clear exactly when it is happening. So the canonical commutation relation in quantum mechanics must be postulated. But we're going to work with the results of these four men. And these are results in what was called old quantum theory, the quantum mechanics from 1899 to 1925. And these are results that Max Planck, Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, and Werner Heisenberg all worked out during this period of about 26 years. During that time, the philosophy that they had was basically that classical mechanics was right. And it only needed a little tweaking. Maybe it needed an extra rule added to it. Maybe it needed a slightly different way of looking at things. Maybe it needed a particular constraint. And from that, we would get quantum mechanics. And that was the philosophy that was pursued during this 26-year period. Werner Heisenberg in 1925 made a breakthrough that actually became the dawn of new quantum mechanics. But I've lumped him into the old quantum mechanics here because, again, the philosophy that he used was classical, mecha classical mechanics plus something, and I will get things to work out. And he was able to do that. And we're going to talk about exactly what he did in just a moment. So these four giants are the people upon which we are basing our work on. And actually, all four of them won Nobel Prizes for their quantum mechanics work. Einstein won it for the theory of the photoelectric effect, where he essentially proved that photons exist. He did not win it for the theory of general relativity. There are five steps to this motivation. The first one is that when we look at atomic spectra, they have sharp lines. The second one is to use what's called the Planck-Einstein relation that says the energy of a photon is given by h bar times omega, and light comes in packets that we call photons that carry energies that are multiples of this h bar omega. This was the formula that was used to describe black body radiation, which is what is in that figure. We're going to work with the Bohr postulate that stationary states exist in atoms and that the transitions corresponding to light emitted from atoms is coming from transitions between these stationary states. Heisenberg was the person who told us that matrix elements will oscillate harmonically at the frequency given by the energy difference. 
and that energy difference is going to correspond to the energy of the light that is emitted when we have a transition between these two states. And the final one is simply that the total energy is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. So here's the start of this motivation. I'm calling it a motivation because it isn't really a derivation. The first thing is that the position operators commute with the potential. And here's the proof. Since the position operators commute with themselves, they also commute with all powers of each other. So here's an example. And we're going to verify this via the Leibniz rule. So let's look at the commutator of Rx with Ry squared. Using the Leibniz rule where we pull one factor of Ry to the left and one factor of Ry to the right, we get that it's Ry times the commutator of Rx with Ry plus the commutator of Rx with Ry times Ry on the right, each of those commutators is zero by our assumption, so that becomes zero plus zero, and indeed we find it's zero. And we can just generalize this to any power, and we'll eventually be able to break it down by using the Leibniz rule into these elementary commutators, and they're all zero. And so any potential that can be expanded in a power series of Rx, Ry, or Rz in any form must commute with the position operators. And so that's the proof of that statement. Now we're going to talk about atoms. When we look at atomic spectra, they have very sharp lines. This is actually a periodic table of the spectra of atoms. And you can see that the spectra of these atoms is very varied. It changes a lot from one atom to another. But we always see sharp lines. And that's really the key. Spectra always come with sharp lines in the spectrum. So the Planck-Einstein relation allows us to relate the energy difference between the incident and the final energy of the atom to the energy of the photon that was emitted. And so that energy difference, EI minus EF, is equal to H bar omega. Bohr was the person that told us we have these two steady states, so the eigenstates, where the Hamiltonian of the atom acting on the initial state will be given, will give an energy times the initial state because it's an eigenstate. And the same for the final state. The Hamiltonian acting on the final state will give an energy, EF, times that final state. All right, so we're now going to commute, uh, we're now going to calculate the commutator of position with that Hamiltonian for the atom. And we're going to write that out explicitly. It's Rx times the Hamiltonian minus the Hamiltonian times Rx. Remember, a commutator is the difference of the products of the operators in each order. We're now going to separate this out into two terms because this operation is distributive. So we have a matrix element of the final state bra Rx h hat initial ket i minus final bra h hat Rx initial ket i. Now, remember, the initial state and final state are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So we can go in and we can evaluate the Hamiltonian acting on the initial state or the Hamiltonian acting on that final state bra. Because the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator, in both cases we get the energy eigenvalue coming out when the operator acts either to the right or to the left. That's the special property about Hermitian operators. They can act to the right or to the left. And so we pull out those energies. We get an initial energy minus a final energy. We can factor that out because the matrix element is the same. Now we use Planck-Einstein, and we get that it's equal to the h bar omega of the photon. And that ends the first part of this derivation. Let's move on for the second part. Heisenberg told us in 1925 that we should focus on the behavior of the matrix elements because he believed those are the things that could actually be measured. So we're going to look at that matrix element, final state, Rx hat, initial state. And he told us that they oscillate at the same fre frequency as the light that's emitted from the atom. This was actually physically motivated from classical mechanics because in Maxwell's electromagnetism, when charges oscillate, they will emit light. And the frequency of light that they emit is given by the frequency at which the charges are oscillating. So this is completely a classical concept. It's the fact that we're using this matrix element that was the key that was making it into a quantum calculation. 
So we have that this commutator of the bra F commutator of Rx with H and ket I, we showed that that was equal to H bar omega matrix element of F Rx I, and I being initial state. And because that oscillates at a specific frequency, it must be given by H bar omega A e to the minus I omega T, where this amplitude A is yet to be determined. We don't actually know what that is just yet. But if f r x i is equal to this a e to the minus i omega t, which is what we used, then the time derivative of that will equal minus i omega a e to the minus i omega t. And so that means that i h bar times minus i omega a e to the minus i omega t is i h bar times the time derivative of that matrix element. And I'm moving the time derivative into the operator. This is the place where we get a little bit hand wavy. I'm going to say that that derivative with respect to time of Rx, that's like a velocity. And a velocity is like the momentum divided by the mass. So I'm going to replace that by I h bar over m times the momentum operator sandwiched between the bra and the ket. And that is equal to the thing that we started with, which is the commutator of Rx with the Hamiltonian sandwiched between the final bra and the initial ket. All right, we're on a roll. We're nearly there. Let's remember to just rewrite that which we have already gotten, our next step is to recognize that this holds for any initial and final state. It didn't matter which one we took. We used no properties ultimately about those states, although we used the fact that they're eigenfunctions. We ultimately did not use EF or EI in deriving this result. And so we can actually drop the states and say that this holds at the operator level. So that tells us that I h bar over m times the momentum is equal to the commutator of R x with the Hamiltonian. This actually goes under a name called the equation of motion. It's one of the two equations of motion. All right, so now we're going to directly com compute the commutator. It's easy to do because we have an explicit form for the Hamiltonian. So I have the commutator of R x with 1 over 2 m sum of px squared plus py squared plus pz squared, all operators, plus the potential expanded in terms of the operators rx, ry, and rz. Now, we already learned that rx commutes with the potential. And of course, rx commutes with py and with pz because the position and the momentum in different directions commute. So we're just left with one term in this commutator. And now, I can, of course, factor out the 1 over 2m. It's just a number that gets factored out of commutators. Now we're ready to use our first identity, our first fundamental operator identity, the Leibniz identity. We get to use that again. And we find that it is 1 over 2m px commutator of rx with px plus 1 over 2m commutator of rx with px times px. All right, now we're in a little bit of a quandary. We do not know whether that commutator of rx with px commutes with px or does not. And so again, this is where we get a little bit hand wavy. We don't know whether it commutes, but we're going to assume that it does. And we're going to try and determine what is the consequence if we assume that it does. I can tell you right now that if we assume that it does, we will get a consistent result. But for the moment, this is an assumption that is being put in that that commutator which is an operator, commutes with the momentum operator. Of course, if that commutator is a number, it automatically commutes with the momentum operator. All right, so let's put this all together. We've shown you that the commutator, this equation of motion, I h bar over m, p x operator is equal to the commutator of R x with the Hamiltonian. And if this commutator is a number, or if it commutes with px, then we showed that the commutator of rx with h, the Hamiltonian, is equal to 1 over m px times rx commutator px. And that's because I combined two terms together. I got rid of the 1 over 2 in the denominator. Now we just equate the two. And we learn that the commutator of rx with px is ih bar. So I really think the way that you should think about this is that if the commutator of Rx with Px is a number, then it must be IH bar. There's no other number that it could be. 
It's a little bit surprising that it's a complex number, but that is what comes out. And again, let's iterate exactly what went into this. We derive the fact that Rx with Px was equal to I h bar. It can be generalized to the canonical commutation relation in 3D, which says that the commutator of Ri with Pj is equal to I h bar delta Ij, which tells us that the position of momentum in different directions commutes, but in the same direction, it's I h bar independent of which direction we had. Now you can see why we use this R sub x and P sub x notation. It makes the writing down of this commutator very easy to do. And it actually will come in very handy with some calculations we're going to do in the future. The result was physically motivated by the Planck-Einstein relation, the Bohr postulate of steady states in the atom, the Heisenberg idea that related time dependence of the matrix element to the frequency of light. And of course, we needed to use the Leibniz rule we also physically motivated it by the fact that atoms have sharp lines, which was the motivation behind the Bohr postulate itself. And so I hope that this has been a good motivation for you as to why the canonical commutation relation of position with momentum is equal to I h bar. And with that, we are at the end of part two of module five, lecture three.